Chapter 7 of Memory, How to Develop, Train, and Use It. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Memory, How to Develop, Train, and Use It by William Walker Atkinson. Chapter 7 Association In the preceding chapters, we have seen that in order that a thing may be remembered, it must be impressed clearly upon the mind in the first place, and that in order to obtain a clear impression there must be a manifestation of attention. So much for the recording of the impressions. But when we come to recalling, recollecting, or remembering the impressions, we are brought face to face with another important law of memory, the law of association. Association plays a part analogous to the indexing and cross-indexing of a book, a library, or another system in which the aim is to readily find something that has been filed away or contained in some way in a collection of similar things. As Kay says, in order that what is in the memory may be recalled or brought again before consciousness, it is necessary that it be regarded in connection or in association with one or more other things or ideas, and as a rule the greater the number of other things with which it is associated, the greater the likelihood of its recall. The two processes are involved in every act of memory. We must first impress, and then we must associate. Without a clear impression being formed, that which is recalled will be indistinct and inaccurate, and unless it is associated with something else in the mind, it cannot be recalled. If we may suppose an idea existing in the mind by itself, unconnected with any other idea, its recall would be impossible. All the best authorities recognize and teach the importance of this law of association in connection with the memory. Abercrombie says, Next to the effect of attention is the remarkable influence produced upon memory by association. Carpenter says, The recording power of memory mainly depends upon the degree of attention we give to the idea to be remembered. The reproducing power again altogether depends upon the nature of the associations by which the new idea has been linked on to other ideas which have been previously recorded. Ribo says, The most fundamental law which regulates psychological phenomena is the law of association. In its comprehensive character, it is comparable to the law of attraction in the physical world. Mill says, That which the law of gravitation is to astronomy, that which the elementary properties of the tissues are to physiology, the law of association of ideas is to psychology. Stewart says, The connection between memory and the association of ideas is so striking that it has been supposed by some that the whole of the phenomena might be resolved into this principle. The association of ideas connects our various thoughts with each other, so as to present them to the mind in a certain order. But it presupposes the existence of those thoughts in the mind. In other words, it presupposes a faculty of retaining the knowledge which we acquire. On the other hand, it is evident that without the associating principle, the power of retaining our thoughts, and of recognizing them when they occur to us, would have been of little use for the most important articles of our knowledge might have remained latent in the mind, even when those occasions presented themselves to which they were immediately applicable. Association of ideas depends upon two principles known, respectively, as 1. The law of contiguity, and 2. The law of similarity. Association by contiguity is that form of association by which an idea is linked, connected, or associated with a sensation, thought, or idea immediately preceding it, and that which directly follows it. 
each idea or thought is a link in a great chain of thought being connected with the preceding link and the succeeding link association by similarity is that form of association by which an idea thought or sensation is linked connected or associated with ideas thoughts or sensations of a similar kind which have occurred previously or subsequently the first form of association is the relation of sequence the second the relation of kind association by contiguity is the great law of thought as well as of memory as k says the great law of mental association is that of contiguity by means of which sensations and ideas that have been in the mind together or in close succession tend to unite together or cohere in such a way that the one can afterward recall the other the connection that naturally subsists between a sensation or idea in the mind and that which immediately preceded or followed it is of the strongest and most intimate nature the two strictly speaking are but one forming one complete thought as taine says to speak correctly there is no isolated or separate sensation a sensation is a state which begins as a continuation of preceding ones and ends by losing itself in those following it it is by an arbitrary severing and for the convenience of language that we set it apart as we do its beginning is the end of another and its ending the beginning of another as ribo says when we read or hear a sentence for example at the commencement of the fifth word something of the fourth word still remains association by contiguity may be separated into two subclasses contiguity in time and contiguity in space in contiguity in time there is manifested the tendency of the memory to recall the impressions in the same order in which they were received the first impression suggesting the second and that the third and so on in this way the child learns to repeat the alphabet and the adult the succeeding lines of a poem as priestley says in a poem the end of each preceding word being connected with the beginning of the succeeding one we can easily repeat them in that order but we are not able to repeat them backwards till they have been frequently named in that order memory of words or groups of words depends upon this form of contiguous association some persons are able to repeat long poems from beginning to end with perfect ease but are unable to repeat any particular sentence or verse without working down to it from the beginning contiguity in space is manifested in forms of recollection or remembrance by position thus by remembering the things connected with the position of a particular thing we are enabled to recall the thing itself as we have seen in a preceding chapter some forms of memory systems have been based on this law if you will recall some house or room in which you have been you will find that you will remember one object after another in the order of the relative positions or contiguity in space or position beginning with the front hall you may travel in memory from one room to another recalling each with the objects it contains according to the degree of attention you bestowed upon them originally k says of association by contiguity it is on this principle of contiguity that mnemonical systems are constructed as when what we wish to remember is associated in the mind with a certain object or locality the ideas associated will at once come up or when each word or idea is associated with the one immediately preceding it so that when the one is recalled the other comes up along with it and thus long lists of names or long passages of books 
can be readily learnt by heart. From the foregoing, it will be seen that it is of great importance that we correlate our impressions with those preceding and following. The more closely knitted together our impressions are, the more closely will they cohere, and the greater will be the facility of remembering or recollecting them. We should endeavor to form our impressions of things so that they will be associated with other impressions in time and space. Every other thing that is associated in the mind with a given thing serves as a loose end of memory, which, if once grasped and followed up, will lead us to the thing we desire to recall to mind. Association by similarity is the linking together of impressions of a similar kind, irrespective of time and place. Carpenter expresses it as follows. The law of similarity expresses the general fact that any present state of consciousness tends to revive previous states which are similar to it. Rational or philosophical association is when a fact or statement on which the attention is fixed is associated with some fact previously known to which it has a relation, or with some object which it is calculated to illustrate. And, as K says, the similars may be widely apart in space or in time, but they are brought together and associated through their resemblance to each other. Thus, a circumstance of today may recall circumstances of a similar nature that occurred perhaps at very different times, and they will become associated together in the mind so that afterwards the presence of one will tend to recall the others. Abercrombie says of this phase of association, The habit of correct association, that is, connecting facts in the mind according to their true relations, and to the manner in which they tend to illustrate each other, is one of the principal means of improving the memory, particularly that kind of memory which is an essential quality of a cultivated mind, namely, that which is founded not upon incidental connections, but on true and important relations. As Beatty says, the more relations or likenesses that we find or can establish between objects, the more easily will the view of one lead us to recollect the rest. And, as Kay says, in order to fix a thing in the memory, we must associate it with something in the mind already, and the more closely that which we wish to remember resembles that with which it is associated, the better it is fixed in the memory, and the more readily it is recalled. If the two strongly resemble each other, or are not to be distinguished from each other, then the association is of the strongest kind. The memory is able to retain and replace a vastly greater number of ideas, if they are associated or arranged in some principle of similarity, than if they are presented merely as isolated facts. It is not by the multitude of ideas but the want of arrangement among them, that the memory is burdened and its powers weakened. As Arnott says, the ignorant man may be said to have charged his hundred hooks of knowledge, to use a rude simile, with single objects, while the informed man makes each hook support a long chain to which thousands of kindred and useful things are attached. We ask each student of this book to acquaint himself with a general idea of the working features of the law of association as given in this chapter for the reason that much of the instruction to be given under the head of the several phases and classes of memory is based upon an application of the law of association in connection with the law of attention. These fundamental principles should be clearly grasped before one proceeds to the details of practice and exercise. One should know not only how to use the mind and memory in certain ways, 
but also why it is to be used in that particular way. By understanding the reason of it, one is better able to follow out the directions. End of chapter 7 Chapter 8 of Memory, How to Develop, Train, and Use It This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Memory, How to Develop, Train, and Use It by William Walker Atkinson Chapter 8 Phases of Memory One of the first things apt to be noticed by the student of memory is the fact that there are several different phases of the manifestation of memory. That is to say, that there are several general classes into which the phenomena of memory may be grouped, and accordingly we find some persons quite highly developed in certain phases of memory and quite deficient in others. If there were but one phase or class of memory, then a person who had developed his memory along any particular line would have at the same time developed it equally along all the other lines. But this is far from being the true state of affairs. We find men who are quite proficient in recalling the impression of faces, while they find it very difficult to recall the names of the persons whose faces they remember. Others can remember faces and not names. Others have an excellent recollection of localities, while others are constantly losing themselves. Others remember dates, prices, numbers, and figures generally, while deficient in other forms of recollection. Others remember tales, incidents, anecdotes, etc., while forgetting other things. And so on, each person being apt to possess a memory good in some phases, while deficient in others. The phases of memory may be divided into two general classes, namely, one, memory of sense impressions, and two, memory of ideas. This classification is somewhat arbitrary, for the reason that sense impressions develop into ideas, and ideas are composed to a considerable extent of sense impressions, but in a general way the classification serves its purpose, which is the grouping together of certain phases of the phenomena of memory. Memory of sense impressions, of course, includes the impressions received from all of the five senses, sight, hearing, taste, touch, and smell. But when we come down to a practical examination of sense impressions retained in the memory, we find that the majority of such impressions are those obtained through the two respective senses of sight and hearing. The impressions received from the sense of taste, touch, and smell, respectively, are comparatively small, except in the cases of certain experts in special lines, whose occupation consists in acquiring a very delicate sense of taste, smell, or touch, and correspondingly a fine sense of memory along these particular lines. For instance, the wine taster and tea tasters, who are able to distinguish between the various grades of merchandise handled by them, have developed not only very fine senses of taste and smell, but also a remarkable memory of the impressions previously received, the power of discrimination depending as much upon the memory as upon the special sense. In the same way, the skilled surgeon as well as the skilled mechanic acquires a fine sense of touch and a correspondingly highly developed memory of touch impressions. But, as we have said, the greater part of the sense impressions stored away in our memories are those previously received through the sense of sight and hearing, respectively. The majority of sense impressions stored away in the memory have been received more or less involuntarily, that is, with the application of but a slight degree of attention they are more or less indistinct and hazy, and are recalled with difficulty, the remembrance of them generally coming about without conscious effort, according to the law of association. That is, they come principally when we are thinking about something else upon which we have given thought and attention, and with which they have been associated. 
there is quite a difference between the remembrance of sense impressions received in this way and those which we record by the bestowal of attention interest and concentration the sense impressions of sight are by far the most numerous in our subconscious storehouse we are constantly exercising our sense of sight and receiving thousands of different sight impressions every hour but the majority of these impressions are but faintly recorded upon the memory because we give to them but little attention or interest but it is astonishing at times when we find that when we recall some important event or incident we also recall many faint sight impressions of which we did not dream we had any record to realize the important part played by sight impressions in the phenomena of memory recall some particular time or event in your life and see how many more things that you saw are remembered compared with the number of things that you heard or tasted or felt or smelled second in number however are the impressions received through the sense of hearing and consequently the memory stores away a great number of sound impressions in some cases the impressions of sight and sound are joined together as for instance in the case of words in which not only the sound but the shape of the letters composing the word or rather the word shape itself are stored away together and consequently are far more readily remembered or recollected than things of which but one sense impression is recorded teachers of memory use this fact as a means of helping their students to memorize words by speaking them aloud and then writing them down many persons memorize names in this way the impression of the written word being added to the impression of the sound thus doubling the record the more impressions that you can make regarding a thing the greater are the chances of your easily recollecting it likewise it is very important to attach an impression of a weaker sense to that of a stronger one in order that the former may be memorized for instance if you have a good eye memory and a poor ear memory it is well to attach your sound impressions to the sight impressions. And if you have a poor eye memory and a good ear memory, it is important to attach your sight impressions to your sound impressions. In this way, you take advantage of the law of association, of which we have told you. Under the subclass of sight impressions are found the smaller divisions of memory known as memory of locality memory of figures, memory of form, memory of color, and memory of written or printed words. Under the subclass of sound impressions are found the smaller divisions of memory known as memory of spoken words, memory of names, memory of stories, memory of music, etc. We shall pay special attention to these forms of memory in succeeding chapters the second general class of memory memory of ideas includes the memory of facts events thoughts lines of reasoning etc and is regarded as higher in the scale than the memory of sense impressions although not more necessary nor useful to the average person this form of memory of course accompanies the higher lines of intellectual effort and activities and constitutes a large part of what is known as true education, that is, education which teaches one to think instead of to merely memorize certain things taught in books or lectures. The well-rounded man, mentally, is he who has developed his memory on all sides, rather than the one who has developed but one special phase of the faculty. It is true that a man's interest and occupation certainly tend to develop his memory according to his daily needs and requirements, but it is well that he should give to the other parts of his memory field some exercise, in order that he may not grow one-sided. As Halleck has said, Many persons think that memory is mainly due to sight, but we have as many different kinds of memory as we have senses. To sight, the watermelon is a long, greenish body. 
but this is its least important quality. Sight alone gives the poorest idea of the watermelon. We approach the vine where the fruit is growing, and in order to decide whether it is ripe, we tap the rind and judge by the sound. We must remember that a ripe watermelon has a certain resonance. By passing our hands over the melon, we learn that it has certain touch characteristics. We cut it open and learn the qualities of taste and smell. All this knowledge afforded by the different senses must enter into a perfected memory image. Hence we see that many complex processes go to form an idea of a thing. Napoleon was not content with only hearing a name. He wrote it down, and having satisfied his eye memory as well as his ear memory, he threw the paper away. In this book we shall point out the methods and processes calculated to round out the memory of the student. As a rule, his strong phases of memory need but little attention, although even in these a little scientific knowledge will be of use. But in the weaker phases, those phases in which his memory is poor, he should exert a new energy and activity to the end that these weaker regions of the memory may be cultivated and fertilized, and well stored with the seed impressions which will bear a good crop in time. There is no phase, field, or class of memory that is not capable of being highly developed by intelligent application. It requires practice, exercise, and work, but the reward is great. Many a man is handicapped by being deficient in certain phases of memory, while proficient in others. The remedy is in his own hands, and we feel that in this book we have given to each the means whereby he may acquire a good memory along any or all lines. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 of Memory, How to Develop, Train, and Use It This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Memory, How to Develop, Train, and Use It by William Walker Atkinson Chapter 9 Training the Eye Before the memory can be stored with sight impressions, before the mind can recollect or remember such impressions, the eye must be used under the direction of the attention. We think that we see things when we look at them, but in reality we see but few things, in the sense of registering clear and distinct impressions of them upon the tablets of the subconscious mind we look at them rather than see them. Halleck says regarding this sight without seeing idea, a body may be imaged on the retina without ensuring perception. There must be an effort to concentrate the attention upon the many things which the world presents to our senses. A man once said to the pupils of a large school, all of whom had seen cows, I should like to find out how many of you know whether a cow's ears are above, below, behind, or in front of her horns. I want only those pupils to raise their hands who are sure about the position and who will promise to give a dollar to charity if they answer wrong. Only two hands were raised. Their owners had drawn cows, and in order to do that, had been forced to concentrate their attention upon the animals. Fifteen pupils were sure that they had seen cats climb trees and descend them. There was unanimity of opinion that the cats went up heads first. When asked whether the cats came down head or tail first, the majority were sure that the cats descended as they were never known to do. Anyone who had ever noticed the shape of the claws of any beast of prey could have answered the question without seeing an actual descent. Farmers' boys who have often seen cows and horses lie down and rise are seldom sure whether the animals rise with their fore or hind feet first, or whether the habit of the horse agrees with that of the cow in this respect. The elm tree has about its leaf 
a peculiarity which all ought to notice the first time they see it, and yet only about five per cent of a certain school could incorporate in a drawing this peculiarity, although it is so easily outlined on paper. Perception, to achieve satisfactory results, must summon the will to its aid to concentrate the attention. Only the smallest part of what falls upon our senses at any time is actually perceived. The way to train the mind to receive clear sight impressions, and therefore to retain them in the memory, is simply to concentrate the will and attention upon objects of sight, endeavoring to see them plainly and distinctly, and then to practice recalling the details of the object some time afterward. It is astonishing how rapidly one may improve in this respect by a little practice, and it is amazing how great a degree of proficiency in this practice one may attain in a short time. You have doubtless heard the story of Houdin, the French conjurer, who cultivated his memory of sight impressions by following a simple plan. He started into practice by observing the number of small objects in the Paris shop windows he could see, and remember in one quick glance as he rapidly walked past the window. He followed the plan of noting down on paper the things that he saw and remembered. At first he could remember but two or three articles in the window. Then he began to see and remember more, and so on, each day adding to his power of perception and memory, until finally he was able to see and remember nearly every small article in a large shop window, after bestowing but one glance upon it. Others have found this plan an excellent one, and have developed their power of perception greatly, and at the same time cultivated an amazingly retentive memory of objects thus seen. It is all a matter of use and practice. The experiment of Houdin may be varied infinitely with excellent results. The Hindus train their children along these lines by playing the sight game with them. This game is played by exposing to the sight of the children a number of small objects at which they gaze intently and which are then withdrawn from their sight. The children then endeavor to excel each other in writing down the names of the objects which they have seen. The number of objects is small to begin with, but is increased each day until an astonishing number are perceived and remembered. Rudyard Kipling, in his great book Kim, gives an instance of this game played by Kim and a trained native youth. Lurgan Sahib exposes to the sight of the two boys a tray filled with jewels and gems, allowing them to gaze upon it a few moments before it is withdrawn from sight. Then the competition begins as follows. There are, under that paper, five blue stones, one big, one smaller, and three small, said Kim in all haste. There are four green stones and one with a hole in it. There is one yellow stone that I can see through, and one like a pipe stem. There are two red stones, and, and, give me time. But Kim had reached the limit of his powers. Then came the turn of the native boy. Hear my count, cried the native child. First are two flawed sapphires one of two ruttees and one of four as i should judge the four ruttee sapphire is chipped at the edge there is one turkestan turquoise plain with green veins and there are two inscribed one with the name of god in gilt and the other being cracked across for it came out of an old ring i cannot read we have now the five blue stones Four flamed emeralds there are, but one is drilled in two places, and one is a little carven. Their weight, said Lurgan Sahib, impassively. Three, five, five, and four ruttees, as I judge it. 
there is one piece of old greenish amber and a cheap cut topaz from europe there is one ruby of burma one of two ruttees without a flaw and there is a balas ruby flawed of two ruttees there is a carved ivory from china representing a rat sucking an egg and there is last aha a ball of crystal as big as a bean set in gold leaf kim is mortified at this bad beating and asks the secret the answer is by doing it many times over till it is done perfectly for it is worth doing many teachers have followed plans similar to that just related a number of small articles are exposed and the pupils are trained to see and remember them the process being gradually made more and more difficult a well-known american teacher was in the habit of rapidly making a number of dots on the blackboard and then erasing them before the pupils could count them in the ordinary way the children then endeavored to count their mental impressions and before long they could correctly name the number up to ten or more with ease they said they could see six or see ten as the case may be automatically and apparently without the labor of consciously counting them it is related in works dealing with the detection of crime that in the celebrated thieves schools in europe the young thieves are trained in a similar way the old scoundrels acting as teachers exposing a number of small articles to the young ones and requiring them to repeat exactly what they had seen then follows a higher course in which the young thieves are required to memorize the objects in a room the plan of houses etc they are sent forth to spy out the land for future robberies in the guise of beggars soliciting alms and thus getting a rapid peep into houses offices and stores it is said that in a single glance they will perceive the location of all of the doors windows locks bolts etc many nations have boys games in which the youngsters are required to see and remember after taking a peep the italians have a game called moro in which one boy throws out a number of fingers which must be instantly named by the other boy, a failure resulting in a forfeit. The Chinese youths have a similar game, while the Japanese boys reduce this to a science. A well-trained Japanese youth will be able to remember the entire contents of a room after one keen glance around it. Many of the Orientals have developed this faculty to a degree almost beyond belief but the principle is the same in all cases, the gradual practice and exercise, beginning with a small number of simple things, and then increasing the number and complexity of the objects. The faculty is not so rare as one might imagine at first thought. Take a man in a small business and let him enter the store of a competitor and see how many things he will observe and remember after a few minutes in the place let an actor visit a play in another theatre and see how many details of the performance he will notice and remember let some women pay a visit to a new neighbour and then see how many things about that house they will have seen and remembered to be retailed to their confidential friends afterward it is the old story of attention following the interest and memory following the attention. An expert whist player will see and remember every card played in the game and just who played it. A chess or checker player will see and remember the previous moves in the game, if he be expert, and can relate them afterward. A woman will go shopping and will see and remember thousands of things that a man would never have seen, much less remembered. As Houdin said, Thus, for instance, I can safely assert that a lady seeing another pass at full speed in a carriage will have had time to analyze her toilet from her bonnet to her shoes 
and be able to describe not only the fashion and quality of the stuffs but also say if the lace be real or only machine made i have known ladies to do this but remember this for it is important whatever can be done in this direction by means of attention inspired by interest may be duplicated by attention directed by will in other words the desire to accomplish the task adds and creates an artificial interest just as effective as the natural feeling and as you progress the interest in the game task will add new interest and you will be able to duplicate any of the feats mentioned above it is all a matter of attention interest natural or induced and practice begin with a set of dominoes if you like and try to remember the spots on one of them rapidly glanced at then two then three by increasing the number gradually you will attain a power of perception and a memory of sight impressions that will appear almost marvelous and not only will you begin to remember dominoes but you will also be able to perceive and remember thousands of little details of interest in everything that have heretofore escaped your notice the principle is very simple but the results that may be obtained by practice are wonderful the trouble with most of you is that you have been looking without seeing gazing but not observing the objects around you have been out of your mental focus if you will but change your mental focus by means of will and attention you will be able to cure yourself of the careless methods of seeing and observing that have been hindrances to your success you have been blaming it on your memory but the fault is with your perception how can the memory remember when it is not given anything in the way of clear impressions you have been like young infants in this matter now it is time for you to begin to sit up and take notice no matter how old you may be the whole thing in a nutshell is this in order to remember the things that pass before your sight you must begin to see with your mind instead of with your retina let the impression get beyond your retina and into your mind if you will do this you will find that memory will do the rest. End of chapter 9. Please support me with a like and a subscription. Thank you.